a good chance for us uh, to really make a uh, overnight improvement. Not even overnight. I mean, by the time we try in the veneers, he's going to get a chance to see what he looks like without any spaces in there. And we already tried the veneers in, and Chris was happy with how they look. So we're going to go ahead and begin the bonding procedure at this part, and you'll get a chance to see them once they're in place. We're using some pumice here. I like to use preppies from Whip Mix and a slow speed handpiece with a Profi cup. And we're doing this to clean the tooth and remove any uh, pellicle that might be on the tooth and just make sure that we have a nice bonding surface here as we get ready to etch the enamel. Uh, we don't feel the need necessarily to use a uh, rubber dam in a situation like this as long as we're able to have good moisture control because there is no exposed dentin which is one of the big advantages of no prep or even minimal prep veneers. You'll notice we have retractors in place. These are the Seymour retractors from Discus Dental. And these are good no-hand retractors that do a good job of retracting both cheeks and the upper and lower lip as well. So we're going to go ahead and rinse off the pumice at this point. And as we do that, we'll make sure that uh, we don't have any extra clumps sitting anywhere. And then we'll go ahead and dry off the teeth. And uh, I wear 4X loops, uh, high-res loops from Oroscoptic, and I'm really still able to see any pumice that might be in or around uh, the tooth, especially around the gingival sulcus, it seems like we get some. So a cotton roll does a good job of removing that. We're going to go ahead and begin the etching procedure with a 37% phosphoric acid. One of the other nice things about no-prep veneers is when you prep veneers and you have had temporaries on for a couple of weeks, the gingiva can get irritated and the acid etch can actually make the gingiva bleed. Uh, typically for no-prep veneers, we have very healthy gingiva because there's been no prepping and no temporaries that have been in place. And as a result, we have the opportunity to uh, go ahead and place the etch next to some healthy gingiva so we don't have to worry about bleeding. Since these no-prep veneers will wrap onto the lingual surface because we are increasing the incisal edge length of all the teeth, we're going to go ahead and use a mirror just to verify that we have, in fact, got the etch onto the lingual third of the teeth. It's uh, pretty easy sometimes to, uh, uh, to overlook that etch, but we do want to make sure we get a good bond everywhere, and we should because we're bonding to enamel, the best bond in dentistry. We're going to go ahead and rinse off the 37% phosphoric acid. As you may have noticed, we have only etched the central incisors so far. And as we air dry this, you'll notice that we see that frosty appearance that we're used to from the old days of bonding when we were primarily etching enamel. What we're placing here is not your typical dentin bonding agent. This is just the adhesive from the Scotch Bond Multi-Purpose Plus kit. And because we don't have any exposed dentin, we can just use the adhesive. There is no need for primer. So... We're going to go ahead and coat the entire etched enamel surface with the adhesive from the Scotch Bond Multipurpose Plus system, as well as making sure we get the lingual third as well, because the veneer is going to wrap over the incisal edge. As we're doing this, my assistant has cleaned the veneers, removed the water-soluble try-in paste uh, from the veneers, and has placed the silane for 60 seconds, evaporated, and then placed a layer of the Scotch Bond inside the veneers and air thin those as well. I'm air thinning the adhesive on the teeth right now to make sure that we don't have any pooling anywhere down by the gingival margin or anywhere else on the tooth. This really isn't as big of a problem as it is uh, with uh, prep veneers because there's nowhere in the uh, uh, preparation for it to pool and keep the veneer from seating. Once we've air thinned that pretty thin, we're going to go ahead and cure that. Depending on the thickness of your veneers, you could wait and cure it once the veneer and the cement are in place. And that's perfectly acceptable as well. But having uh, tried on these veneers already, I know I'm going to be able to put that adhesive on, cure it, and go forward. Now we've gone ahead and placed the cement into the veneer itself. And this is Insure from Cosmodent. It's a thicker veneer cement, and uh, I like it because it makes cleanup a lot easier. It's really nice to be able to clean it up. Uh, with uh, just something like an Explorer or just something like that. The runnier a veneer cement is, the more likely it is to get in between the teeth, into the embrasures, and make it very difficult to be able to remove it. I'm using an orange wood stick here, typically on the incisal edge and the facial surface to make sure that the veneer is seated all the way. And again, using an orange wood stick is kind of a level to make sure the incisal edges are level as well. Typically with a good fit on your veneers, that's not a problem and they should fit the teeth just as well as they fit the model. So as I put some pressure on these teeth just to make sure they're down all the way, my assistant's going to do a little tack and wave, which is a cure right over just as you see, two passes there at a couple seconds each. And then I go ahead and judge the viscosity of the cement and if it's still not set all the way, she'll come back in for another uh, one and a half, two second cure. 
And you can see that as I start to work the Explorer under this material, it has gotten to its gel state, which makes it very easy to clean up at this point. The thinner veneer cements tend to run everywhere, and it's a little more difficult to do it. And I can see over here uh, on the distal that it's not quite cured yet, so she's going to give me another second and a half, uh, two seconds, and we're going to see, and that appears to have set it up. So we'll go ahead and be able to remove this in one big piece. This is nice because this is the way we're used to cleaning up crown and bridge cases when we use conventional crown and bridge cement. In this case, we're doing veneers, and veneer cleanup is typically one of the harder things we do uh, in general dentistry. And this tack and wave technique of removing this entire piece of cement at one time, as we've done here, really makes things a lot easier. Once we remove this large piece, we can then take the Explorer and go around the margins, check in the gingival embrasures as we're doing here, and remove any other excess that's there. But certainly the ability to remove that large piece right at the beginning saves us a ton of time with cleanup as we go through this. We're going to cure the lingual for, again, one and a half to two seconds, and I'll remove any excess that we have back there as well. And once we begin to remove this excess, we've done most of the cleaning, and really all that's left is uh, for us to go ahead and clean interproximally with some dental floss. We're going to make our first attempt to go through between the central incisors with dental floss, and we were successful. That's the reason when we do the tack and wave, why we try to keep the light away from these interproximal surfaces. We'd rather just cure right at the gingival and set the cement there and not necessarily cure it interproximally where it's going to be difficult to remove later. And that's one of the things I like about Ensure is the fact that we are able to cure in one spot and not necessarily uh, cure adjacent cement. And as you saw, we were able to work the floss in between the two teeth. It wasn't too tough on the distals because we did have some pre-existing diastema. Once we've cleaned up the interproximal cement and the facial and the lingual cement, uh, we're going to go ahead and do a full cure on these two teeth. Again, the reason we do the two central incisors first is because they're very critical to the outcome of the case. And when you're trying to seat a bunch of veneers together, if you do have contact issues, it makes it difficult to deal with because everything's kind of a moving target. So uh, when I do these types of cases, we'll put the, the central incisors on first, and then we'll go ahead and place the rest of the veneers. And if we have contact problems, then we'll just kind of make it up as we work our way back. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and etch the lateral incisor, the cuspid, and the first bicuspid. And uh, we're just slowly moving our way posterior. We're going to get the second bicuspid here. And then uh, because these veneers do wrap onto the occlusal, we will get uh, some etch on the occlusal surfaces as well. Then we will go ahead and after waiting 15 seconds for the etch to take place, we will go ahead and uh, rinse off all the acid etch from these teeth and dry them and then follow the same uh, bonding steps that we fought, that we uh, proceeded with before on the central incisors. Once again, we're applying the adhesive from the Scotch Bond Multi-Purpose Plus system to the etched enamel surface. As you dry that etched enamel surface, you will notice the frosty appearance that we're used to seeing. And we're going to air thin the adhesive as well. Here we're using a Viva stick from Ivaclar Vivident to place some of the smaller veneers, and it sticks extremely well to small restorations like uh, veneers or inlays and things like that. In fact, you have to hold the restoration down just to get the stick off. And now that we're seating this all the way, we take our orange wood stick and we're putting some pressure on the facial. And we're going to place the cuspid as well with the Viva stick, and then I use my finger to stabilize the veneer as we pull the Viva stick off. Again, with the Viva stick, you'll never worry about losing a veneer because it's got such a nice fit. We're going to go ahead and do the tack and wave again for one and a half, two seconds. And after three applications of that, you can see the Ensure is starting to set up and peels away very cleanly from the facial margin. If we can't get the floss through, which we weren't able to do between the central and the lateral, we are using a serrated strip from Axis Dental. This is a safe-sided strip that doesn't remove on the mesial and distal, but has serrations on it so that you can cut through any bonded resin, whether it's bonding agent or resin cement, that keeps the floss from going down. Of course, you do have to be careful when you're using this, working it back and forth so that you don't cut the gingiva. We're now placing the bicuspids into place, and again, with these smaller veneers, it certainly is nice to be able to use the Viva sticks, and then I'm just going to hold on to the restoration with an Explorer while I pull the Viva stick off the restoration. Now, what I'm doing here is I've got a finishing burr, a fine diamond finishing burr that I'm using to go around the margins. I'm not standing on the rheostat at all, so the burr is not spinning. What I find is these finishing burrs work very well, almost like a scalpel, except it's not sharp, to go around the gingival margin and remove any small overhangs of cement that are left. They really do a great job because they're thicker than an Explorer, and they have an easier time. They don't bend like an Explorer, and so as you use them, you're able to pop that extra cement off. If you do find you have a bulky margin, as long as you're in there with the burr, you can go ahead and smooth that down at the same time. 
Here we're using a 7408 carbide burr uh, to go ahead and make any, uh, sm any adjustments on the back. Typically what we're doing here is removing any excess cement at the veneer tooth uh, juncture and we're going in and using this to remove that and anywhere where the uh, ceramic might be a little thick, a little over contoured, or just a little bit rough, we're using the 7408 to smooth that off so that the patient's tongue uh, won't be able to feel the transition between the veneer and the tooth. When we finish smoothing everything off on the lingual, the next step is to use our articulating paper to go in and see if we have any prematurities. And if we do have any prematurities, or actually what happens more commonly is we have some excess cement that's left over. When you use a translucent resin cement, oftentimes you'll have excess resin cement that you didn't see on a tooth, and that ends up being your high spot. So we use the 7408 to not only remove any excess cement, but to take care of any uh, excursive uh, uh, areas that we want to remove from the ceramic material. Or in fact, if we do have an area where uh, we do have a high spot. The 7408 at relatively slow speeds does a good job of uh, removing ceramic material without uh, uh, causing a lot of the roughness that you can have with something like a diamond. If I'm going to use a diamond for this purpose, I will use a very fine diamond like a 30 micron diamond football burr. Now we've got our uh, Cavo Slow Speed electric handpiece out, and with all that torque, we can really get some nice uh, polish uh, on the veneers as we finish up here. This is the last stage of the Brassler Dialyte. We've gone through the two previous wheels, and now this is the gray uh, high shine wheel, and we're going in at about 20,000 RPMs with a ton of torque, with the opportunity to go in and really polish these up and really make them look nice. You really don't see the big difference till the very end when you actually use uh, that gray wheel and go along there. After we've finished polishing with the Brassler Dialyte series of wheels, we're going to go in with a product called Rapid Glaze, and we're going to place this on the facial surfaces of the teeth, and we're using an Oclu brush here. This is from Kerr Have. And what this is is a aluminum oxide impregnated brush that goes in a slow speed. And we're going to use this at relatively low speed, five to 7,000 RPMs. In the beginning, we're going to use heavy pressure and then lighter pressure to really put a nice high shine on the facial aspect uh, of our ceramic veneers. When we're done polishing, we're going to go ahead and rinse off the rest of the polish from the veneers and uh, take a look and see how they look and see if we've got anything that uh, needs to be touched up. You can see on the before picture the big spaces that were present before. And this is one of the great times to use a no prep case when you've got somebody who needs a little additional tooth length, has some large diastemas in between their teeth because you can accomplish both those goals at the same time. You notice we still have a small uh, black triangle at the gingival margin between 8 and 9 in that gingival embrasure. And sometimes with a no prep case, that's impossible to close a large diastema completely. In fact, that's a really good job that the technician did on this case. If you do want to close that completely, or if that's one of the patient's requirement, I would suggest that you prep the veneers, you prep 8 and 9, and drop the margin slightly subgingival. Use a soft tissue model, and your technician should be able to close it completely. This case illustrates one of the really good uses for no prep veneers. The patient came in with multiple diastema between his teeth and he could use a little extra tooth length as well. And since there wasn't a big requirement to remove any tooth structure, this case really did lend itself towards a no prep approach. Another one of the things that makes this a great no prep case is the fact that we don't have many facial limiting factors. And what we mean by facial limiting factors is teeth that are sticking out towards the facial. We know that when we do a technique like this with the thin press veneers, they can be pressed as thin as 0.3 millimeters. But if a tooth is already too far out to the facial, adding another 0.3 millimeters to it is not going to solve any problems. In Chris's case, none of his teeth were...